Good afternoon. I would like uh, to welcome everybody, but I think there are also some special welcomes uh, in order here. Mike's. I hope, yes, this works better. So what I said is uh, that I wanted everybody uh, to join me and leave the room. I'm kidding. <laughs> I hope you stay for a little while, but later on I would like you to join us for a very nice reception, I think. But what I wanted to do is I would like to welcome you, and I think a special welcome is in place for some uh, special guests that we have here. And I think uh, I'm quite happy to have a, a number of representatives of, of different countries where we are working together with for a long, long time. And um, I even think that uh, uh, I, maybe I can call them a founding father, and that's um, East uh, Pakistan, now Bangladesh. So I'm, I'm very happy that uh, people like that are here and have uh, a trust also in the Institute and show their willingness to collaborate, and I hope we can do that. I also would like to welcome uh, my colleagues uh, sitting here up front. Uh, some of them will be uh, your lecturer uh, later this year. So. Uh, uh, I think um, and first getting to know uh, each other, I think is also quite important. I also would like to very welcome everybody who's online there. But uh, I think the real, real special guests for today are all uh, the new students that we have received here. So I uh, really would like to welcome you. And uh, I would like to start with an applause for our students. I think that uh, this, this is uh, the first day of a journey that uh, we will do together. And I think such a journey also deserves a good starting point. So I hope that we stay. We have this starting point uh, here. You're already here for a couple of days, have had the first experience. I think uh, we were quite uh, happy that uh, we also managed to influence the Dutch weather a little bit. So at least you also have not too bad an impression of how the weather looks like here and that we have a quite uh, nice sunny day. A bit fresh, but still good. Time to come, um, I think, is something where you will learn a lot of different things. And I think uh, one of the things that uh, you will learn is uh, how uh, you can um, say absorb knowledge here. But I also hope that you have time uh, to um, yeah, enjoy what you're doing, that you enjoy the learning, that you enjoy uh, the content that you have here, but also the living here together. I hope that you will enjoy the meeting students coming from other countries, that you will get impressions from other cultures, that you also get an impression from the Dutch culture. And I am quite happy to see also two representatives that are organizing the Dutch Friends here, or Meet the Dutch, that uh, will also help you to find your way a little bit here in the Netherlands, but also uh, get to know uh, how uh, and habits are here in the Netherlands. Also quite happy to see some representatives that made it financially possible for you to be here. Also, I think always very important. So I think with all those people here together, uh, I hope that we can reach out to you together, hold our hands and see how we can make a big success of this journey for the coming year. But I also would like to stress that for us, that don't end after this year. So I also hope that this journey is the start of a lifelong journey and that we would like to keep in touch with you, like to walk the path of your life together with you and see how together we can make a success 
And I think we need you. We need you very urgently as well. Uh, this year is also for the people interested in water a special year. Uh, you probably know that next year there will be a conference in New York. There's a general assembly of the United Nations taking place in March during World Water Day, the 22nd of March, where they will talk about water. That's the second time ever that they will discuss uh, the topic of water. And uh, this is so special because it's a general assembly of the United Nations. And normally they talk about all these difficult problems that we see in wars and other crises. But this time they will discuss water. That's not only for the ministers of water, it's also for the presidents, the kings, the queens, all the representatives of the countries to be there. And I do hope that you will help us not only in sharing this knowledge, but after that, I do hope that there will be commitments and that you will help us to fulfill those commitments. So I'm really counting on you that you will join us in this commitment to the water sector and by water also to achieving all the sustainable development goals that we think are depending on water. So with that, I would like uh, to actually give you a little bit of a flavor on what you may expect uh, in the year to come. And for that, uh, I would like to ask uh, Hector Garcia to say a few words about, uh, I think, what, what uh, interests him in, in uh, being involved in the water sector. And I hope that that will also be an inspiration to you to listen to more what he has to offer. Hector, the floor is yours. So I'm not that tall, so I need to accommodate this. <laughs> so good afternoon, and thank you, Eddie, very much. So I would like first to thank the organizing committee for inviting me today to deliver this uh, speech. And particularly, uh, I would like to welcome uh, all the new uh, students to, to this new academic pro program at, at the IHEW. So when I was uh, told, when I was invited to, to give this talk, the first thing that uh, came to my mind uh, was that moment uh, when I, myself, also as a student at some point, uh, initiated that very same uh, journey that most of you uh, are starting today. So then I was thinking, and I was absolutely sure that I have a, I have a picture uh, somewhere uh, of my very first uh, day uh, abroad. And uh, yes, yeah, so what I needed to look for that picture, I was searching on my hard drives. I find out that I was not very organized with my pictures. It took me an entire Saturday uh, afternoon to look for that. My wife and the kids were not that happy with the way that I was spending my weekend. But I have a good news, and the good news is that I found it. And here it is. This is uh, August 2005. So if you don't notice, I'm the, the guy on the left side of that picture. <laughs> and of course, I gained a little kilos in, the, in these last uh, 20 years. That was in the, in the airport, in, the, in, in, the airport in, in Austin, Texas. I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, well, and that was my first day abroad. Uh, I was just leaving my home country, uh, Uruguay. And it was the first time I was leaving my place, I was leaving my family, my friends. Uh, so, and it's probably the situation uh, with many of you uh, today. So I guess now uh, you're going through similar feelings and emotions I was uh, experiencing those days, and, and that is normal. So I wanted to share something with you that uh, may help, and that you probably see this uh, before. And uh, probably you're still in what is called the honeymoon phase, right? <laughs> uh, everything is new, so you're meeting new people. Everything is uh, very uh, exciting so far. But let me tell you something. Things may change a little bit in a few days. First, the weather here, is, it will change. The winter is coming. It's getting cold 
and dark, or dark and cold in, in that order. Uh, and the workload at Daiichi will start to be little demanding. So I'm pretty sure you will find things a little bit more difficult than usual. However, I will tell you something that you will adapt, you will adjust, and at the end, this experience is totally worth it. I, I promise that. So there are many other uh, universities uh, and institutions worldwide that you could have selected to, pers to pursue your graduate uh, education. There are hundreds of institutions, universities, research centers, and all of them are great and they offer excellent graduate programs. However, none of them have what IHG Delft uh, offer. And that is what I see, is the opportunity for developing a strong international partnership. And you can see here, there are people from everywhere in the planet. At IHG, you will be exposed to a very international group of people. IHG staff, we all come from somewhere, students, project partners, working together in practical and applied research and projects. So you will get a unique opportunity to get exposed to real life projects and real life situations. And so you will take that knowledge, experience and network back home with you. And that is indeed what I think it makes IT quite unique and quite amazing. So through this talk, I want to give you some examples of that. I would like to emphasize that even though uh, and of course, all these examples of projects that I will show you that I experienced, they all have some technical challenge, uh, of course. But I would say that the most important intervention in all of them, in all of these projects that I'm going to share with you, was to set a strong and collaborative group of people working together to achieve the same goal. The stronger the partnership, the better the chances of success in these projects. And I'm pretty sure that here at IG, you will have an opportunity to experience that at, at some point. All right. So first, this is the first project that I would like to show you. So weather is different in Cuba, so we call it the Cuba project. Uh, so as you may have heard, uh, food security is a big issue in Cuba. And that was the main topic of this particular project. Cuba is a great place to work but things are a little challenging over there. For instance, uh, well, the, the system is, is different compared to other experiences that I had before. Just a little example, everything that we needed for this uh, project, we needed to procure to buy it here in Europe and then ship it to Cuba, go through all this uh, importation process there that is not easy to get the equipment there uh, up and running. So if you don't have, if you don't work, and if you don't develop that strong partnership, forget it. The project, you're done. The project is totally over, as we experience with other projects there. So in this project, I will show you two innovations that we were working. So first, we were transferring an intensive urban aquaculture system. It's called RAS. RAS means a recirculation aquaculture system. So food security is a big issue there. So enhancing the fish production, uh, it's something that they, they, they would like. So here you can see in the pictures at the left side, this is the drawing, the schematic of the recirculation aquaculture system that we were building there. We just, uh, we were growing fish in these tanks and then we were recirculating the water through the biological uh, filters and physical chemical treatment. We'll not go in details into that. But in that way, we were saving two uh, very important resources. One that you are here, uh, it's water, of course, and the other is energy. So and at the right side, you see our partners there in Cuba working hard building the systems and getting ready for, for the installation of the system and operation. So and then what you see is the first uh, fishing event that we have in Cuba. We produce six tons of uh, catfish. So the big thing that we achieve through training, transferring the technology, working together, learning together, is that we were able to increase the fish density uh, and we were able to produce 125 kilos of catfish per cubic meter of water. In Cuba, they were used to get two kilos per cubic meter. So that was, you know, great uh, achieving. It's amazing uh, transformation. We were able to produce more fish with less resources. We were able to recycle water and recycle energy. 
So that was a great achievement. But nothing of this could have been achieved if we don't have a strong partnership with our local partners there. And that also helped in the Institute that we speak Spanish. And there are staff from everywhere, so that also helps a little bit. So on the right side uh, of the picture, you can see our beauty there. I mean the beauty of the catfish that is uh, <laughs> ugly, but it's, uh, it's very it, it tasty. It's an ugly fish, but uh, you can eat it, uh, trust me. All right, so that was the first innovation. The second, it's uh, related to wastewater treatment. So in Cuba, there are many uh, food processing uh, industries, but there is not much wastewater treatment. So there we transfer a second technology that is called a membrane bioreactor. I will not go into details of that technology, but you can see the performance of that uh, technology. On the top left figure, you can see uh, from left to right the, the quality of the influent wastewater that we were treating, that blackish thing. And then the second water shows the quality of the treated water. So as you can see, it's super nice from just from the eye. So, and then you can see also that the system produced a sludge, what we call a sludge in biological systems. And that sludge, we are in Cuba, that is very sunny, it's hot. So we put it in sludge drying bags, as you see in the picture below left. We let it dry, and then we got that dry material that is very rich in uh, nutrients in nitrogen and phosphorus, and so it's ideal to use as fertilizer. So we have water, so we have fertilizer, so we say, why don't we build a greenhouse? So we found some nice lettuce and chard, and let's say, let's do it, and that is what we did. So we have a very nice uh, a production, again. So and again, a food security is an issue in Cuba, so together with our partners, we develop a strategy for recovering water, for recovering resources, and apply that into the uh, food uh, production. And again, partnership. None of this could have been done if we don't set before a strong partnership with our Cuban friends. Nothing of this could have been done. All right, the second project I want to show you, a second innovation, uh, it's in the context of the, the Syrian refugee crisis in Jordan. So, we were not working, this is a picture of the Satari refugee camp in Jordan. We were not working in the camp, I just put it there to set the, the context. So in a refugee camp, there, and, and probably you heard about that, there are high chances of uh, outbreaks of disease like cholera outbreaks, that's probably the most popular, if proper sanitation uh, is not provided. So in that context, and to help to solve this problem, we developed a technology based on microwaves, same microwaves as we have uh, at home, uh, for treating a fecal sludge, right? And by treating fecal sludge, I mean sanitizing, killing all the pathogens, and at the same time dehydrating the sludge, removing the water from, from the sludge. So we built this pilot that you can see at the left side of the picture. They, it has some pretreatment systems and microwave systems, and we uh, ship it to Jordan. I would say IHEI developed a strong expertise shipping equipment uh, on top of, of the technical issues. So it's hard to ship it there. It's hard to get the importation into Cuba, into Cuba, into Jordan in this case. All right, this is the system. So we got a, a fecal or septic sludge. So then we find out that it, it came from a hospital, so very nice. It was one week before this uh, crazy COVID uh, started. And then at the right, you can see, again, partnership. We collaborate with the German Jordanian University. And they are our project partners in the site helping us setting up the system. So they were conditioning the sludge. And at the bottom of the figure, so you can see what, well, what you think is, your thinking is right, is that in the number two in the, in the bucket. So this system, we first have a preliminary, the water uh, uh, filter press. So at the left, you see the starting material, that, that is the fecal sludge, the septic sludge. Then that was concentrated, that means the water was taken out. So you see the sludge that is a little bit more concentrated and blackish. And then at the right, you see the, the water that was extracted from that filter. So that water at the left side of the figure is uh, treated into some uh, filtration process, ultrafiltration, then reverse osmosis, and we were able to produce a water that uh, super nice quality water for many different reuse applications, irrigation, whatever, and even if we keep uh, treating that water, even for drinking water applications. 
and at the if you build all these social things related to that. And at the right, you see the, the sludge we put in the microwaves, and we were able to dry that up to an 80% by solid content. And we produce a second product that is uh, that, that also has many applications. It's very dry, it has a very high calorific value that can be used as a fuel, as energy, it can be incinerated, but also it has a rich content in nitrogen, phosphorus, organic matter that also could be used as a, a fertilizer. So in this project, again, we convert septic sludge into two valuable resources that are scarce in that area. And again, we were able to do that, we were able to do these projects by developing first a strong partnership, mostly in this case with the German Jordanian University in Jordan and all the water related uh, organizations there. And third, and the final uh, example that I wanted to, to show you, and with this I promise I finish, is the, this project that I think is the best project ever. And the only reason is because it's in Uruguay, where I'm from, <laughs> but it's not the best project ever. So um, th that uh, started, it's an example of capacity building. So it started with the picture you see at the, at the left side uh, of the screen. So we signed a collaboration with the Uruguayan government. There in the middle, you can see the woman that was the uh, general director of UNESCO at that time, was visiting Montevideo where we signed the agreement. So and we were able to train, or we have been training so far, uh, 40 uh, water professionals from Uruguay that they come to IG as you are here today to get uh, their education at master and PhD level. But also we find out that not everybody could get a scholarship. So you were lucky that you get one, but none of your colleagues could get the same scholarship as you got. So we were thinking on how can we improve the number of people or how can we expand our outreach? And the idea was to take the programs there. And that is what we were doing. Simultaneously, around 2011, 2012, our research group got a project financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to, to build a sanitation master program of a one year master program here in Delft and then to transfer that program to Southeast Asia and to Sub Saharan Africa. So, those were the regions where the Gates Foundation uh, they have interest. But also, we were able to convince our partners from Uruguay to uptake, to adopt uh, that program. And that is uh, what we did. So, this year in May 20, the, the May of this year, so we started a, a master program. We were taking 10 courses from two different specializations here in Delft, and we were able to build that program in, in Uruguay that started in, in, in May this year. So what was nice of that program, so we didn't know if we will get enough people, we get 40 participants on the, on the first year of the program. So you can see people doing research in the lab and the, the group picture below. But not only we were able to put the students from Uruguay, but also students from, uh, from the region there. So that shows that, you know, there is a high interest on that and it's a way of expanding our outreach. So the take on message, I want to tell you that if I was able to build in this program in my home country in Uruguay, I think uh, also most likely you also can play a key role in your home country when you finish your education here contributing to strengthening the water sector there in your country. All right, so by this I finish, but I talk a lot about partnership, but I also want to acknowledge uh, all our partners that were able to contribute to this project. And our partners in Cuba, the agency there, our partner in Jordan, in Uruguay, in Slovenia, our PhD participant working in this project, and of course, uh, our team uh, in, in our research group, uh, Dami was fundamental to get most of these projects. Carlos helped uh, and got the Cuba project. Tineka the, on the Jordan project and the other colleagues, Tina, Claire, Francisco, Alex and Siris helping with the project in Uruguay. Beren is not in our research group, but we like him and we adopt him in the, in the group. Uh, anyways. Well, with this, I would like to finish with my uh, intervention. Uh, I want to thank you all for your attention and I wish you all the best and much success in your study. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. Uh, we now continue with a surprise interlude. At Aichi Delft, we find social and cultural activities. Um, I now invite the president of the so um, sorry, Student Association Board, 
Mr. Aman Melat, the floor is yours. How many of you knows what Dutch Street is? Miriam Webster defines it as a meal or other entertainment for which each person pays his or her own way. And in this memorable occasion, let me share with you some of the learnings for me to deserve my place at the reception later. But first, I have a question. What do the Dutch and the rest of the world need for kissing? Yeah, we need tulips. <laughs> tulips. Keeping aside, tulips, the flowers, are best during spring. And while we are in autumn, think that each one of you who signed up for this IHE Delft journey from Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Europe are just like these tulips that the world expects to bloom in due time with the right amount of nurturing with less sunshine. So how do you bloom? First, share a meal with someone. In the short run, each one of you will become master chefs in the making. So devour in the rich combo flavors of Philippine adobo and Chinese soup and dumplings, of Colombian arepa and Ecuadorian colada morada, Italian pasta, American burger with German beer, of course, and Kenyan Ugali or Zimbabwean uh, salsa with a little bit of Ghana Shito. <laughs> you may even find yourself at the lunch table with Eddie or Charlotte or IHE leaders. And in the shared experiences like this, you will find comfort to start, continue, and end your day. Second, share moments to play whenever you can. My idea of play in this context is to travel and see the old world. My first international trip with the IHE family was during the last year's Christmas holidays. We closed the bars in Prague and Budapest, had the experience of COVID-19 restrictions going to Sofia, and welcomed the new year with Southeast Asians, Afghan brothers, and Indian families. And days after that, most of the MENA residents actually had COVID. <laughs> so for most of you, this will also be the first time to celebrate Christmas and the holidays away from home. So if you suddenly miss the Andes Mountains in Peru, Caribbean beaches in Jamaica, Guyana, or the Latin American parties in Argentina, Mexico or Nicaragua, plan ahead your visit to Switzerland, France, Spain, or the Nordic countries. And we hope that the visit to the Dutch sand dunes organized by your lovely social cultural office ladies by the end of the week can make up for your sudden longing of the Moroccan and Egyptian deserts. <laughs> Third, share your knowledge and wisdom. At IHE Duff, each one of us is trained to be a techno-manager, meaning the modules are designed to find the interplay between the soft and the hard sciences and prepare us to contribute to the aims of sustainable development with a holistic and pragmatic lens. We come from different educational and professional backgrounds. For me, who had been in the public sector for a decade, I found myself sharing space with private sector practitioners from Lebanon, Burkina Faso, Yemen, Liberia, Zambia, for example. This year, we will have colleagues from Malawi, Sierra Leone, Niger, Somalia, Sri Lanka, Libya, Eritrea, Cameroon, Mali, among others. So sharing your local knowledge and wisdom to others can provide an avenue for you to find solutions to local and regional concerns from the watershed of exchanges at IHE Duff and beyond. This practice of sharing led me to partner with AWOD on a project related to urban water flows in a nation context. Fourth, share your time to listen intently. 
As an educator myself, teaching economics to Gen Z learners, I find time to listen more to students. At IHC Duff, a similar strategy is done by listening to life stories that each one of you has to offer and is willing to share. Indeed, it is also value adding to listen. May it be about the recent Brazilian elections, the issues concerning the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dom, the climate-related challenges in the Mekong Delta, Bangladesh, Maldives, or in Fiji, or all the price dynamics of the OPEC countries in Iran, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Nigeria, and Congo. Through this intentional listening, each one of you will grow your perspective of the world with water as dependent variables to these stories. To sum it up, to share is to care. We are all here because we care for the future of water. We are here because at one point in our lives, we believe that we can nurture the flow of what needs to be done towards the achievement of sustainable development. And in due time, we, as tulips, will bloom. Thank you, and let us continue to live and win. Thank you, Oman, for your great words. We now continue with the next uh, issue in the program. It's uh, the Olumni Awarding. And for that, I uh, ask my dear colleague, Maria Laura Sorrentino, to the stage. Thank you, Anik, uh, distinguished guests, alumni, yeah. <laughs> colleagues and students. My name is Maria Laura Sorrentino. I'm an alumni officer at Aichi Delft. And I would like to congratulate all new students on this commencement of their studies at Aichi Delft. Congratulations and good luck and all the best. Well, today we also celebrate the Alumni Day. Why? Because many professionals, our alumni, also have started their studies at the Institute one day in October, November before of you. And IHE has more than 23,000 alumni worldwide, and they form the biggest water professional network in the world. They are our best ambassadors, the best ambassadors that IHE has, and we are very, very proud of them. In this ceremony, we have the pleasure of awarding one of our exceptional alumni. This year, we will have the eighth alumni award at IHE Delft. The award is given annually to an alumna or alumnus who has proven to be a role model for other water professionals. 38 nominations were received this year and the jury members were very impressed and with the overall quality of the work and their proposals. Good. I would like to invite to the podium our rector, Eddie Morse, to announce the Alumni Award winner of this year at IHE Delft. So thank you, uh, Maria Laura. And uh, I also think that this is always a very a special uh, moment. And um, maybe this, this is a double uh, special one. And that has to do with the fact that uh, uh, besides uh, being somebody who did a lot of work, uh, um, I think our alumni winner of this year took a little bit of time to do um, a, a bit of her last studies. And the last studies is a PhD degree. Uh, she had a good reason to do that. Uh, but one of the reasons was also uh, that and, and, uh, was COVID. And that was not the only reason, but I'll come back to that later on. But I am now in the happy position that uh, because of COVID, we were not allowed to give a physical appreciation on what she did, that is finishing her PhD, uh, that we can do that now. So I would like to call on stage uh, Joy.
So not all our alumni winners uh, also have this uh, sort of treatment here. So uh, Joy, this is a special one. I um, was the, the vice chair of uh, your opposition. So you had to defend uh, the work that you did, your thesis. And uh, we all congratulated you virtually, which, which is really not the same as doing that uh, in person. And uh, the thing that we did not manage to push through the screen was this. <laughs> and uh, I know that uh, if um, you don't get this in a physical way, uh, people at home will ask, yeah, okay, uh, you said you did your PhD de de degree, but uh, can you prove that? Uh, no, I can't because I, I have nothing to prove. Um, so I, I would like to congratulate you. And now I need a little bit uh, my, my notes there because I like a short title and Joy did not manage to give a short title for a PhD thesis. So I need a piece of paper to read out the title. And the title is Offsite Enhanced Biogas Production with Concomitant Pathogen Removal from Facial Matter. And that's a little bit in line with what uh, Hector was uh, showing uh, before. Uh, but I do think that, um, that Joy uh, managed to do different things with that. And um, I'm first going to congratulate you with your PhD, and then I will say a few words why we think you are such a huge award winning deserving alumni. I think. And that's what I And as you all know, um, when, when you uh, do your PhD degree and you do your, your exam there, uh, you have to um, have one hour in which uh, you have to answer all the questions that people pose uh, to you. And I think that uh, Joy did that in an excellent way. And when um, she then was also put forward as one of our alumni uh, excellencies, uh, we, we have a big number of them, and I always think that we just pick out one. Um, but it's a little bit like choice as well, because uh, a lot of our alumni are doing great work. What struck me, myself, quite a lot, and um, uh, Joy, I think you're now working at um, the, the Meru University in, in uh, Kenya. Uh, you're doing, of course, a lot of work that is also asked from you being academic, working at the university. But what struck me the most was actually that uh, you have uh, such a big drive uh, not to only do this, but also uh, to take um, youngsters and also uh, some elderly people, but especially youngsters and then females by the hand and try to push them actually on the path of uh, development. And as uh, you may know, uh, sanitation is, is a big issue in that. Uh, in uh, a lot of countries, uh, sanitation is thought that it's a given thing, but in a large number of countries, it's not like that. And often, um, women are more suffering from the lack of sanitation than men are doing in a lot of different ways. So I also think that um, choosing one had to do this, uh, getting uh, women there, but also being a role model, because that's another issue, being a role model uh, for um, yeah, female students to follow the path in technical science, like uh, sanitation is actually, I think uh, deserves uh, a big, 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 big applause. And that's what I would like to give to you. And uh, like you have a proven uh, thing for your PhD degree, we also would like to give you something uh, to show that you are our alumni award winner. So, Maria Laura. So with that, I would like to give the floor to, to Joy, uh, because uh, um, I think she can be an inspir inspiration to also all of you here. She is to me, and um, Joy, the mic is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Without protocols observed, good evening. 
Actually, today I'm lost for words, completely lost for words. This is indeed a special honor. And what I can say, I'm really grateful to all my seniors and mentors for helping me come this far. It's really a great honor. I feel I have no words to express how I'm feeling now. The awards that have gotten today will remain an inspiration to me, an inspiration to keep being focused an inspiration to always achieve more in the future. A constant reminder of my commitment that I made when I was leaving IG in Delft, that I will live to serve humanity. I said I will live to serve humanity because was it not for humanity, I would never have studied. It was through the scholarships that I got that I managed to be here. I came to serve a purpose. I knew the challenges in Kenya. So when I was coming here, I knew I had to get a solution. I was helped to study amidst these challenges. When I left, I knew I had to get this solution to my people. And this award will always remind me that I am on the right track and I'll achieve. First, I want to recognize the immense contribution and the achievements from all alumni across the world. I know I'm not the best. We are doing a lot to promote the name of IHE. The name of IHE across all the countries is burning. We are there. Actually, we are all winners. That's what I can say. Today, I'm serving my second year. I graduated in January last year, 20th of January. That's when I joined the alumni network. So actually I'm serving my second year. Since that time, I've been involved in quite a number of activities since the time I left here. My journey in my activities started when I left this particular institution to work on my thesis. That was in the year 2016. The year 2016, I was done with my field work and I was feeling that I could do my research, my dissertation and publications for my country. That is where my family was. So I left. But when I was going, I had this thing. The skills I had could make a change. That was my inspiration. When I reported to my place of duty, I work with Mary University of Science and Technology. I've been serving there since 2012 when I was recruited as a assistant lecturer. So when I resumed duty, in my mind there were two things. To change the situation of my country, to get solutions, and to write, work on my publications, work on my thesis, and graduate. When I went back, more news awaited me. I was given an appointment as the Dean School of Engineering and Architecture. That was in December of 2016. I felt this is maybe too much and may not be able to, but I decided to take up the challenge. I successively served two terms. I was in charge of three teaching departments, civil engineering, electrical and mechanical engineering. <laughs> but when I was still doing this, I was still working on my research. I was still thinking about sanitation programs and research in my university. We didn't have anything like this in Kenya. We didn't have that. And I was like, how do I get in to do this? So when I'm still serving as the dean, I decided to initiate. I worked on a proposal of my management and said, I have something to offer to the community. I'm seeking to establish sanitation research and programs in Mary University of Science and Technology. Initially, it was not easy, but with time, it was possible. So in September of 2019, a center was formed, Sanitation Research Center. That was in September of 2019. I am there with all the technologies I know about fecal waste management. In my culture, 
we don't talk about human waste. For me, coming to IH had given me that exposure to change my mind. I wasn't attached to those beliefs. But then this is a community. I needed to show them it is possible. So the next thing I worked on is establishing a treatment unit within the university, managing waste from a sanitation complex, from an education complex. There was resistance about where will you take this human waste, where will you do that? But the issue is university, we have huge chunk of land, 650 acres. So I was given the farthest corner to put up my plant. <laughs> Initially, people were not willing to join me there. But I assured them it was okay. I was using only one technology, the black soldier play, because it's very easy to establish and learn. So with the time, we came on board. They started to come to buy protein for their chicken. I had the people now in my pocket. I was very happy. Within this time that I'm proving that it is possible, we can change the way things are being done. I'm still thinking about programs. I'm the only one who knows this. What do I do? One person can't change. So I'm thinking, how do I now get these programs? I started short courses, free course lunch, two weeks. These same people don't want to come because it's, it's shit. But with the time, I got some people to train. I started training the short courses. Then when I'm still doing this, I'm still wondering about how do I get people to study? So luck came in 2019 when we got a grant by IG Delft. Transfer of sanitation programs to universities in Africa and Asia. That was a dream come true. I got this particular project and launched the program in January 2020. I was very happy that I now had people who could afford that program in Africa. Coming here, you only get one, but in Africa, the tuition and everything is not as high as here. So I got my first bunch of 45 students, girls and men. Being a woman and knowing what the challenges which are there, I started you know, running after the university, exploring possibilities of partial funding to girls. Please fund these people. I succeeded. My girls got partial scholarship. This was another milestone that I got. So I can say that up to date, across the programs that we have, Master of Science in Sanitation, Graduate Professional Diploma and Short Courses, I have 284 students who are in class, and I'm very proud of them. <laughs> so when I got this, it was still ringing in my mind that it's not complete. When these students are done with the masters, where do they go? Career progression. Will they go to Europe for their PhD? I said, no. So I mobilized my team again. We did a PhD curriculum. PhD in sanitation. I already have applications, the students are coming in January, and I feel I did good on that. After that, I looked back, bachelors. I developed a curriculum for Bachelor of Science in Sanitation. The curriculum is complete. We are expecting the first batch, government-sponsored students in May of next year. So when I'm that, I see my vision of having sanitation programs in Kenya is in line. It is complete. Like now, the students you're getting for sanitation are drawn from across the field. So the, the curriculum is heavy because you have to bring all of them to board. But now when I have this line complete from the bachelors, it will be very easy to have the students being trained. When I was still doing this, I was still pursuing the university. I was not comfortable with the center because it was nowhere within the university statutes. I pushed them a bit further. In April of last year, a directorate was started, Directorate of Sanitation Research Institute. That was in April of 2021. 
I was given now that to lead as the director. That's why I say I'm the director of Sanitation Research Institute. That's my baby, a baby that I want to help walk. Around 2020, I realized students have issues, especially research sanitation. When you go to labs, people don't want you to bring this shit in their lab. <laughs> My students were suffering. And then I said, no, I have to do something. I searched for some funds and built a structure, a state of the art, FICOS Lunch Management Lab. It is complete. The project I have now is equipping. Already I have equipment to facilitate some studies, but it's not complete. So the project I'm working on now is to ensure that that lab will be able to accommodate students from across the region because we'll be having all that it will take for all the samples to be analyzed in that particular lab. Then uh, at, the, at the country level, we have issues about sanitation. I had a lecture in the morning and I was being asked, how do you get to talk to the government people? I got an entry point. We now have created a lab hall. I'm able to be invited in forums. When they are having their breakfast meetings, I'm called to present and such. Of key importance is when we're doing the national sanitation management policy, my input was very key. That policy is just a waiting to be signed. Once it is signed, I'm sure whatever it takes to promote sanitation, to enhance sanitation has been captured there. Once it's implemented, I'm hopeful that the sanitation space will start taking shape. Then for, also for the students that I'm dealing with, most of them, I accommodate them in my ongoing projects. After coursework, the students are supposed to go for research. And that is the point you normally lose students in Kenya. Because you have the students, after coursework, they're supposed to get their research. So that, when they go for research, issues of money, they just disappear. So I have projects, so I, I invite the students to come and work on research in projects, actually addressing the issues on the ground. Then at the community level, I'm smart and I'm seriously focusing on girls and women empowerment. We have an association in Kenya that is called Women in Water and Sanitation. This was started in the year 2016. This particular forum focuses on raising awareness on issues of gender equality women empowerment and inclusivity in the water and sanitation sector. This forum is a voice for sanitation. We want to make the invisible visible. In this particular forum, I am the chair, research and capacity building committee. Additionally, last year, 2021, I started an initiative that is called Women Beyond Science. Women Beyond Science because I am a woman. I have grown through the process. I know the challenges. I want to reach out to the girls in primary and secondary school. I want to empower them so that as they grow, they are prepared to take up the challenges and also take up the leadership roles. I want them to know who they are and appreciate who they are. So while doing all that, I'm still a mother to two boys. At the peak of everything in 2019, I got a baby. I was multitasking, nothing failed. <laughs> so now, that is what I've done. But what did it take to be there? My journey is something that is very difficult to talk about. Actually, I'm just here to tell the new students, everything is possible and, and everything is possible as long as you have the focus and commitment to make it happen. It doesn't matter what you have. 
but you know where you are going. As a young girl, I grew up in a very remote village. Pisa parents. A very in Meru. When I was growing up, we had all the challenges. I'm from a family of eight. Five girls and the three boys. My mother was a housewife. We know the rope mothers pray in their upbringing. So she had all the challenges. There was struggle for everything. Water and sanitation is something you don't even want to remember about. By that time, I remember we had a very poor pit latrine. That was 100 meters from the house and the mango trees. That's where our toilet was. Within that compound, there were three homesteads. The children and the adults were about 40. That's what you are sharing. So today when I get publications talking about open defecation, I relate, I know that, have done it. That is where I was then. And then that particular time when I was growing up, we were supposed to take care of our brothers. As we were shown, fetch water. You are, that is shit. Go and throw that shit in the toilet. That is the type of life that I passed you through. When I could remember about and think about getting married and getting babies and seeing how what my mother passed you through, reading about gender-based violence, have seen it with my eyes. So I really never wanted to imagine that my kids would go through that. I was wondering how can I change the life of these kids? How can I change this community? In particular, I was so much focused on water and sanitation. Within the village, getting as carries, the, the worms themselves, you find open defecation, but it's not shit. It's a heap of worms. That could hurt my feelings. The good thing is, my parents, though, at that level, they valued education. I went through primary school and secondary school, though almost always at home because of fee. There's no fee. I was focused. I did well and joined a public university, that's Ijaton University, under government sponsorship. That is when there was light. That's when, that's the first time I spent a semester in school without it going home. And that was done. I did my, my degree and completed the five-year program. Then after that, I was interested in pursuing a master's. When do I get this master's? And then that particular moment, there was this issue with women in engineering. This, this something had also been instilled in us. You don't have that confidence to talk about what you can be able to do. Yes, you have it, but you don't have the confidence even to talk about what you have, which was a very big challenge. So it took me seven years after my first degree to think about my master's. And then that was in the year 2008. I really didn't have money, but I felt I had to do this. I felt this was the only way that could set me free. I went to Jomo Kenyatta University of Science and Technology and joined a master's in environmental engineering and management. When I was going there, between me and poverty, I had 700 US dollars. That is what I had. I was, I just said, I have to get this thing. I went and registered. Fortunately, there was no issue of being sent home for fee. So I did coursework and did extremely well. There was an exchange program between Jaikwat and the university in Finland, La Pelanta University. Being the best student, I got that. I went to Finland. Going to Finland, I did my work. I prepared my dissertation and came back. When coming back, I'm rich. I was paid. I have stipend. So I came and paid my fee. And I graduated record time of two years. After graduating, I got a part-time job at Kenya Water Institute. I served one year. 2012, 
I got the appointment now for Meru University of Science and Technology as a assistant lecturer. The same year, there was a call and a for IG call for PhD students, 20 PhD students on, on resource-oriented sanitation. This is where my heart was. And I said, why not to try? I tried. This was in April. In around May, I received a call from my prof, Yavan Lea. He have given you this position. I was very happy. And from there, the rest, I can say his history. I joined IIT, very good supervision team, very nice environment, very nice staff. And by the year 2016, my coursework, my project, my research work was like done. That's when now I traveled to Kenya to start doing what I had learned because I had that particular call. So like, like you hear, that story was not easy. It's only that I knew what I wanted. I had no connections, but I had the focus and I believed I could make it. So for the newcomers, don't worry about where you came from or how you got that opportunity to be here. Have the focus, have the commitment and push forward. Just know what you want to do. What do you want to acquire? IT will be able to give you all that. For the award that I have here, I can only dedicate it to all professionals in the water and sanitation field. Let us push to serve humanity. And to my Ministry of Water and Sanitation Kenya, this thing serves as an assurance that small steps in the right direction will ultimately make a change in what you have in Kenya. So it doesn't need to be abrupt. It just needs to start small and we'll be able to get there. So what we can be able to say, there's nobody who is safe. We are not safe here if people out there are not safe. Nobody is safe until we are all safe. I can say that I am and will continue being a sanitation ambassador. My efforts may be few. They may look insignificant owing to the magnitude of the challenges that are there. But just like our famous Nobel Peace Prize winner, Professor, late Professor Wangari Madai said, I will be a hummingbird. I will do the best I can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joy, for your inspirational words. We now continue with the Vice Rector of IHG Delft, Charlotte de Pretire, to throw it here. Thank you. What, what, what shall I say after such an address like this? I mean, I, I, I feel that. Uh, thank you, Joy, for this incredibly inspiring uh, story. And, and if, uh, if you want more, Want me hear more uh, from Joy? Uh, there is a, a lunch seminar uh, tomorrow. It's called the Water in Practice Container Based Sanitation, and it's uh, quarter to one, twelve forty-five in B one. So it's a small auditorium. So, um, as as we said, my name is uh, Charlotte de Vertu. I'm a vice rector, and as such, uh, responsible for the uh, for the education. Uh, I'm probably as excited uh, as you are about this day. For me, it's, it's really personally also a great day because we started uh, uh, a, a new master program, uh, the Master in Water and Sustainable Development. We have been working hard and, and thinking deep on, on how to make this a good, interesting and, and really worthwhile uh, program. And, and so I, I would like to, to say a few words on, on what you may expect. And uh, the, the, we, we put a lot of emphasis, uh, more than we did in previous years, on active learning. 
And uh, active learning is, is an active process. And, and for you, the new students that already started a, a few uh, before you came here, we asked you, what do you want to learn? In Delft, while being here, think of what, what are your learning goals? What, what do you want to do with that knowledge? What, where will you want to use it for? And so that we ask you to write some uh, learning objectives. And also, the program is flexible or as flexible as possible to accommodate that and, and you can choose your own uh, uh, topics and your own uh, learning trajectory. And, and of course, uh, we, we, uh, um, um, we, we assigned you a, a coach for supporting that in, that in, in kind of creating that learning, uh, learning trajectory. So I hope you, and I think you met them, all the coaches by now, uh, and, and so I, I, I hope that you could also uh, already uh, get to know other, uh, some of our staff, our coaching staff and teaching and as well as the teaching staff. Um, let me go. Uh, active learning is, is also about applying the new knowledge. So we took an effort just to make sure that, that the courses are designed such did you get the opportunity also to apply your newly uh, learned uh, uh, knowledge? And uh, active learning is also not a, a lot, not only about uh, knowledge, but also about skills. So there will be a lot of emphasis on uh, research skills, presentation skills, critical reading, academic writing, working in multidisciplinary groups, and uh, debating, and, and also communication of science, science communication. The, another aspect, that's the multi and the, uh, interdisciplinarity. So as we already heard now, I mean, water is, is, is by its definition, is a multifaceted and multidisciplinary disciplinary, disciplinary, uh, uh, issue, a challenge, right? So you cannot solve any water-related problems with your own discipline, with one discipline. Uh, so if you look around in this, room here, we have a lot of disciplines, we have a lot of backgrounds, we have a lot of uh, uh, different perspectives. Not only in this room, but also if you leave this room and you go in your classroom, <coughs> in the canteen, in, the, in Mina, in, in where you will live or where you already live, there's a lot of different people and, and different, uh, I think Hector also mentioned it, and, uh, about the, the, the many uh, disciplines and, and internationalities that, that are here. So this is basically an ideal environment to look at water challenges uh, from the different perspectives and from the different angles. Uh, ecologists, they have a very different perspective on water than, say, diplomats or social scientists or biologists or uh, a chemist. So and I hope you can be open to these different viewpoints and that you will look, learn to look differently at, at water. Um, you, of course, you are a very diverse group, uh, and of course, it's very tempting to you know, choose in your own discipline, to be in your own little bubble with your own country, uh, um, people from your own country. However, I, I hope, I really sincerely hope that you take this truly unique opportunity to get out of your own comfort zone and basically reach over to other country, uh, other people from other countries, but also from other disciplines. And I hope you really can disagree with each other and, and have a good debate on uh, and, and really bring out those different uh, uh, perspectives. And, and that's only where the creativity comes from that we need for uh, addressing these water challenges. So we have a very small institute, so you will get to learn us. As uh, the sub uh, uh, chair was already saying, that you'll see us at the lunch table, you see each other at the, at the lunch table. Um, and I hope, sincerely hope that you gain a lot of uh, new uh, friends here uh, from the teaching staff, but of course also from your, uh, from, from your uh, roommates, your classmates. And, uh, because basically that's what we all need, right? For now, I mean, if you read the newspaper, you really need uh, well, the, the, for, for, for addressing the water challenges I have, you really need you, basically. We really need inspired, passionate and bright water professionals. So I, I hope that you will enjoy your 
time here in this uh, uh, in, in IHE, but also thereafter. Um, finally, to get you to here to Delft, there were a lot of uh, hard work and preparation uh, to get you through the admission process, the flight tickets, the visas, etc., etc. So I also would like to um, uh, uh, thank the people who made this possible to get you here where you are uh, now. Um, and one more before I finish, and we go because did you manage this? Did you notice the smell, the nice sweet smell that came from? Okay, yeah, but it's it's we need to go there. But before we go there, right? Uh, we would like to uh, facilitate a meet and greet between our new students and the representative of the embassy uh, and, and also some people from uh, the, the Rotary also here. So right after we leave this, uh, the, the auditorium, the cortege leaves the, uh, auditorium, to, uh, the auditorium, uh, we would like to invite the people, the special guests from the embassies to go just outside here, look for the flag of your country, uh, and then I would and and the rotary I think also has a has a small table with a flag or a banner. Uh, then I would like to ask the students here to look up uh, the flag of your country if if there are, is if it's a representative here, and and basically meet up uh, with the uh, with the staff of your uh, embassies here. Um, then, after you found each other and hopefully had a, a quick chat, please join us downstairs uh, for uh, further festivities and enjoy the Dutch treats and the, well, you gave a different definition, I will give a, the, diff, the, the treats you will, you will uh, taste uh, downstairs here. So with that, I would like to close the ceremony and uh, I wish you a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, at IT Delft. Thank you.